Bali, published many articles and a number of books, including Giuseppe Bottai e la cultura fascista, Italian fascism, its origins and development, two fairly recent books on the Italian left, in Stalin's shadow, Angelo Tasca and the crisis of the left in Italy and France, and then the Italian left in the 20th century. Alex is currently working on a Giuliti in the politics of the period. Alex? Actually, uh, I, I was wondering if the bird would like to pay the price of admission and we'd let the bird in. Uh, seems to be sitting out there, but it seems to have gone away at this point. Maybe it realized I was going to speak. Um, <laughs> um, Giovanni Giolitti's essential contribution to the Italian political process came in one move when, as minister of the, in the Zanardelli government of 1901, he decided to apply a new policy of tolerance to private labor disputes. In so doing, he set up a whole framework for politics, a whole new framework for politics. The shift in attitude of the state towards the peasant and factory worker from hostility to neutrality and even occasionally to benevolent mediation during the labor strike, during labor strike was greeted by reformist socialist leaders as the dawn of a new age. A decade later, these hopes have been largely disappointed. The politics remain just that, a shell. The disillusionment which marked the end of the Galician era was partly the fault of Galician, who often promised more than he could deliver, but it was also the result of a serious misreading of the conventions by leading socialists. Such a misreading had been perpetuated by later historians who accepted too easily the definition of Galician as a democratic or left liberal. Even if we accept the idea that Galician's overall strategy was to englobe the popular parties of the extrema, Within the constitutional framework, what does this mean in practice? In 1901, Giuliani argued in the Chamber of Deputies that there were only three parties in Italy the clerical, the socialist, and the constitutional. But Giuliani made it clear that it was his liberal party that intended to compete with these new parties, which were in fundamental ways his opponents. Giolitti believed that the Liberal Party was at the center of the political system, not just because the clericals were on his right and the socialists were on his left, but because it represented the only way to govern in Italy. Giolitti also drew an important lesson from his first government in 1892-93, that it was difficult to maintain power in a stable way with a ministry drawn exclusively from one part of the chamber. Only briefly during the months before the Libyan War in 1911 did he fall back into this position. For most of the years in power before World War I, Giolitti specifically rejected the creation of a two-party system. His governments were open to both sides of the political spectrum. When he moved to the right, there, were always, there was always a potential opening to the left. Any move to the left, as in 1911, had key figures from the right wing of his majority waiting on the sidelines to rejoin the government. Uh, and in this way, he continued a political practice of dividing both right and left and setting both right and left against elements of the right and the left of the, the liberal uh, majority and the, uh, the parliament against one another. Um, although in March 1911, Jolie seemed to believe that a stable majority might be created, exclusively by the center-left. When the Libyan war revealed that such a center-left coalition was not possible, he did not resign, but rather tacked to the right. The price for this flexibility was an unsatisfied longing for political clarity in Italy. Roberto Vivarelli argued that the problem was, I quote, with the very quality of his political faith, which was never profound enough to direct his actions and, within certain limits, bind them maintaining a certain balance between thought and action and assuring that minimum of coherence in the absence of which even good programs, that is, good intentions, meet the fate we all know. One of the great illusions of the leading socialists was a perceived distinction between Jaliki and Jalikismo, which the reformists within the PSI often used to save their relationship with Jaliki. They, they sought to separate Jaliki from his majority and to split that majority by driving out its right wing 
by forcing the pace of reforms. Of course, they never succeeded, at least entirely. Jolitin's view of the Socialist Party was totally realistic. He quite correct, correctly never viewed the Socialist Party as a single political force. He distinguished among the parliamentary party with which he constantly worked on concrete projects, even when relations were most tense, the reformist cooperative and union movements which he supported, and the revolutionaries whom he actively repressed. One must distinguish them between two levels, the administrative or pork barrel deals which were fundamental to the lives of socialist municipalities and cooperatives, and the area of broad, broad political strategy and legislative agendas. <clears throat> Whereas even the socialist opponents of Jaliki could work with him on the first level, and not even the reformists had much input on the second, more important level. Brun Brunello Vigetsi was absolutely correct when he wrote that it is better not to speak of a Jolitian Toratian system. The two men diverged as much as they cooperated, and they cooperated on Jaliti's terms. Torati made the fundamental miscalculation to believe that Jaliti would be willing to opt finally for one wing of his coalition. Several issues drew Jaliti and the reformists within the Socialist Party together at the beginning of the 1901-1911 period. These were a belief in the fragility of the Italian political and so, uh, of the Italian political and social development faith in gradualism, a preference for negotiation over direct action, agnosticism on free trade, and a confidence in the expansion of the state sector. While these important points help explain the degree of cooperation between Jaliti and the socialists, they were eventually outweighed by other, more, more fundamental issues which, were, uh, which separated Jaliti from the vast majority of socialists tax reform, the military budget, limits on unionization of the public sector, a growing belief in the corruption of the Jalitian majority, and finally, the Libyan war. The rest of this paper will examine these issues to determine the extent and limits of the Jalitian socialist relationship. Uh, both Jaliti and prominent reformists like Turati were firmly gradualist in their approach to Italian development. As early as 1901, Jaliti argued that the, the better educated and organized working class, the less likely its recourse to violent strikes. He did not believe that the government could alter the laws of the market. All it could do was help level the playing field. Jaliti argued for a steady pace of reform, which would avoid violent shifts in the social development of Italy, but which would eventually bring the country closer to more advanced economies. In 1904, Turati, during the debate over the government's program, also stressed that one, and I quote, one need not be socialist, nor belong to this or that party. It is enough to be modern men to understand that the best way to resolve these disputes consists in raising the level of the masses of workers by getting them used to consider themselves not as subordinates who have everything to fear from the bosses and from the state, but as a collectivity of free and responsible citizens. Insofar as they both prefer negotiation to force, Jaliti and the reformist socialists shared an interest in the maintenance of order. Turati was quick to remind Jaliti how, how much he depended on the reformists during the agricultural strike wave of 1901. And I quote, You have up to now maintained order in Italy with a relative economy of disasters and suffering. Do you, do you believe that you can continue to do this much longer, remaining within the general policies of the cabinet? You have maintained order also a bit thanks to us. But fundamental disagreement over the meaning of order became more apparent in 1901, 1902 and 1903. When Claudio Treves asked Jaliti what exactly was public order, the Prime Minister responded somewhat superficially that it was the, uh, at this point, the Minister of the Interior, responded somewhat super, superficially that it was the opposite of disorder. Treves then shot back that the use of troops against strikers was also disorder. Jaliti rejected this. Quote, the Italian army is composed of all social classes, especially the popular classes, who have a much higher sense of the fatherland than you have. Jaliti made four fundamental distinctions when dealing with labor unrest. First, between economic and political, especially general strikes. 
Secondly, between private and public sector strikes. Third, between strikes in the North and those in the agrarian South. And fourth, between strikes led by reformists and those sparked by revolutionaries. In the case of a reformist-led economic strike, he would generally instruct the prefect to intervene to help arbitrate a settlement. If the strike were judged to be political, it was a different matter. Uh, responding to a question on the 1908 strikes in Amelia, Jaliti noted that they, quote, that they had something in common with contemporary strikes in Puglia, and I quote, with this difference, however, that in Amelia the workers are organized, but unfortunately in many places no longer in the hands of the reformists. They have fallen into the hands of revolutionary elements who seek to empty, to eliminate the purely economic profile of the struggles between capital and labor and to give them a political nature. Jaliti was especially harsh in putting down agricultural leagues in the southern strongholds of his borders. And so, in doing this, he rarely admitted their political or economic content, but rather relegated them to violations of criminal laws, in part because legislation covering common criminality was often harsher than were the laws dealing with the right to work. A major area of disappointment for the reformists came over Jaliti's handling of public sector strikes. Surati publicly identified with the unionization movement within the state sector, and Jaliti just as resolutely worked to, uh, to combat it. Jaliti also showed himself more than willing to support the harsh disciplinary measures against the strikers on the railways, even though the reformist socialists intervened to moderate the punishment. He introduced a civil service bill which gave wide latitude to dismiss workers not only for strikes but also for obstruction. Turati's close identification with the postal workers and his fight against the Leakey Civil Service Act in 1907 and 1908 had long-term consequences. Turati failed to appreciate how fundamental Jaliti considered the issue, but the resulting impasse created an image of a more despotic Jaliti and deepened the futility which gripped both Turati and Anna Kulishov between 1908 and 1911. A seething frustration easily came to the surface in his correspondence. Quote, the government excludes us from everything. This does not make me unhappy. I don't have time and the time and patience to add more work to what I already have. Then in a somewhat contradictory manner, he went on. In other times, the government occasionally let us take part in commissions. Now one only gets in by a breakdown in a majority. Surati's bitterness certainly played a part in the advice given to Bisolati in March 1911 not to enter the government. Jaliti himself, when asked by Bisolati why he did not turn to Torati, as he did in 1903, cited Torati's close identification with the unionization of civil servants as one reason for his choice. Torati's ironic comment was, long live the postal and telegraph workers, and they say that they were to have served as my springboard to office. See how I am clever without intending to be. The pace and direction of Jalitian reformism inevitably became an issue between reformists in the PSI and, the, and Jaliti. It was with considerable satisfaction in 1906 uh, that Jaliti stated in Parliament that, quote, Italy fortunately today finds itself in a position where it can concentrate above all on its internal order on public services, on questions basically which call for reasoning and not agitation. Far from rejecting the center-right orientation of his long 1906-1909 government, Jaliti was quite proud of its achievements. He centered on the completion of the conversion of the national debt, some tax relief, but no overall project for tax reform. And Jaliti continued to defend on heavy local taxes and duties on items of basic necessities as sources of revenue. He refused to use the surpluses from the debt conversion for a major restructuring of fiscal burdens. Instead, the gains for the general public came in the form of a shift in spending to public works, especially after the nationalization of the telephone and railroad services, and to education. Direct social legislation was undramatic, limited, and fiscally cautious. Guaranteed Sunday rest, increased support for old age and pension funds, improvement in legislation on child and female labor. Two issues exhausted the socialist patients with the temple of the Jalitian program of reform. The first was Jalitian's failure to live up to the promise of fiscal reform. 
No politician spoke of tax reform as much and over as long a time as Jaliki, but did as little about it once in power. Even in 1909, when he raised the issue just before the fall of his government, tax reform did not then figure in the program of the 1911 ministry. In a letter to Turati in 1903, Anna Kulishoff noted that fiscal reform was a precondition to any project for major structural reform. Instead, Jaliki involved different parts of the socialist movement in his system by offering partial but concrete advantages that cut the parliamentary group off from the masses without any corresponding gain of influence in the formulation of broad political strategy, which Jaliki said alone or within a restricted group of advisors. Uh, although in 1911 and 1912, he actively consulted on his legislative agenda with key leaders of the Estrema Sinistra, on balance, one could not say that the socialists had much influence in, in shaping broad policies. To break out of this seemingly vicious circle, and I might add here that Jaliki conducted five elections, or managed five elections in his, in his career, 19, 1892, uh, 1904, 1909, 1913, and 1921. Three of the five were directed against the socialists. One was partially directed against the socialists, 1909, and only 1892 could be somewhat neutral. Uh, um, uh, the, 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 um, to break out of the seemingly, the seemingly vicious circle, the PSI at its Florence Congress in 1908 called for a series of great reforms, universal suffrage for both sexes, school reform, tax and customs legislation, and the nationalization of public services. Anna Kulishoff felt that the struggle for these reforms might renew the ties between the reformists and the masses. As the socialists rebuilt their links with the masses and mobilized opinion behind reform, the role of parliament would temporarily become less important. But the emphasis on major reforms ran into a second obstacle, which troubled relations between Jaliki and the socialists, military spending. Although in actual terms, Italy spent less on the military than other major powers, the percentage of military expenditures uh, rose uh, dramatically. I won't give you the statistics there. there. It, given the influence of the king and the military ministers, Jaliki could not radically alter military budgets. Instead, he did all he could could to draw the socialists into accepting the logic of military expenditures. In 1908, Turati wrote to Kulishov that the parliamentary group split on the military budget. When the Commission on the Military came up with revised figures on levels of military expenditures after pressure by the socialists, he wondered how the party could disavow its own work. In fact, Bisolati and Bonomi saw that it was futile to try to work with Joliki. With, while holding out hope that he would compromise on the military budget. More realistically, but in the end no more successfully, they sought to find a way to pay for both military and social expenditures by means of tax reform. If all of this is true, then how do we explain the offers by Jaliki to Turati in 1903 and to Bisolati in 1911 to join his government? The two cases need to be separated. In 1903, despite Jaliki's protestations, but he made no commitments before offering a place in the cabinet to Turati. There is evidence that the Prime Minister did not expect a successful negotiation. He understood very well Turati's position in the party, and Turati himself doubted, doubted Jaliki's seriousness in making the offer. If the Socialist leader accepted the split, the Socialist Party, uh, if, the, if the Socialist leader accepted, and split the, the Socialist Party, it would have satisfied Jaliki's desire to domesticate the Socialist Parliamentary Group. When this did not happen, he moved ahead with a different agenda. In forming his 1903 government, Jaliki had ambitions which went, which went beyond merely an opening to the left. He also wanted to undermine any challenge to his government from Sidney Sonino's right by enlarging his majority as much as possible. He did this in part by bringing in new faces. Jaliki recalled that except for Luzzati, most of the others were first-time ministers. Ronchetti at justice, Majorana at finance, Pedotti at war, Rava at agriculture, industry and commerce, Saluti Scala at post, Mirabello at navy. 
He built bridges to the right by recruiting Francesco Tedesco from the Sanino camp by bringing in Luzzati and Ella and Pierugini very early in, in the cabinet negotiations and by offering the foreign, sec- foreign ministry to the pro-clerical Titone. But in the end, Giuliani accomplished the second aim in 1903 and 1904 that had long ter- the long-term effect of creating the Giuliani system. Francesco Barbagallo, in his study of Southern electoral politics, noted that in March 1902, when Zanardelli and Giuliani won a confidence vote on their confrontation with the railway workers, the majority of Southern deputies voted against the government. By, by June 1903, the split on confidence was even. Although when Giuliani formed his government, the two Southerners, Paterno and Rosano, turned out to be troubled nominations, this proved far from fatal. By opening to the right, Giuliani won 82 of 98 members of the Southern delegation in the vote of confidence on his government in December 1903. Barbagallo sees this as the moment when the Giuliani majority began to coalesce. Giuliani followed up Zanardelli's special legislation for the South with several measures of his own to reward some Southern supporters. The final step came in the elections of 1904. Forty percent of the Southern delegation was replaced, and the Southern opposition to Giuliani was gutted. If Turati had joined the government in 1903, the Giuliani era might not have taken uh, might have taken on a quite different character, or might not have happened. But there is also a strong possibility uh, that it would not have taken place at all. In this case, Giuliani was perfectly at home with the new center-right majority, which emerged from the 1904 elections. In fact, Giuliani used the formation of his 1906 government to further weaken the right opposition. Part of the crisis of reformism was the awareness that the socialists could make no substantial gains as long as the Giulietian system remained unbroken. This difficulty for both Kuleshov and Turati, the difficulty for both Kuleshov and Turati was that they had no idea how to undermine it. Although the right reformists like Bisolati and Bonomi were far more flexible in dealing with the obstacles blocking and understanding with Giuliani, they were no more successful in breaking the majority either. It was this intellectual impasse that led Kuleshov as early as 1909 to consider a clear split within the Estrema, which might have put Bisolati in the bourgeois democratic or radical camp. The left reformists seemed to alternate between hope and despair in 1909 and 1911, with despair often gaining the upper hand. The final stage in the pre-war relationship between Giuliani and the Italian socialists came with Giuliani's sudden shift leftward and his adoption of the cause of universal suffrage. The suffrage bill proposed by Giuliani in 1911, accompanied by the offer to Bisolati to join the government, was again designed to split the PSI. As many contemporary observers pointed out, Giuliani's sudden conversion to the suffrage cause was somewhat difficult to explain. The socialists had been divided on the franchise and had not been able to use the issue to mobilize a mass movement to pressure Parliament. Moreover, Giuliani was on record against both universal suffrage and pay for deputies. In March 1911, the Giuliani put themselves to the right of Luzzati in working to kill a less drastic suffrage law which combined a literacy test with obligatory voting. Even Giuliani's close relationship with the prominent radicals cannot entirely explain the switch because the radicals had accepted the substance of Luzzati's reform as a first step. While Bisolati and the right reformists and many of Turati's own allies reacted favorably to Giuliani's offer to bring the socialists into the government, Turati remained suspicious and reserved. Giuliani was undoubtedly far more serious in 1911 than he was in 1903. He had convinced himself that the time was right to divide the reformists from the revolutionaries in the PSI. Giuliani's only personal contact with the revolutionary faction of the Socialist Party came in Parliament, and they were not close. His dealing with the rest of the Socialist Revolutionary base were matters of police control and surveillance. There is no doubt that Giuliani's remarks about relegating Marx to the attic reveal both an optimistic misreading of the mood at the base of the Socialist Party and a failure to understand the depth of division within the reformist faction itself. 
But the statement and the enthusiastic reception to it in the liberal parliamentary camp clearly revealed the leaky feelings that the time had come to bring reasonable socialists into the constitutional framework. Curiously, Jalici's position coincided with the ideas that had been germinating in the mind of Anna Kulishov. In June, well before the outbreak of the Libyan war, she returned to her idea of 1909 about the formation of a new social democratic party, which would be free to move towards Jaliki while leaving the left reformists within the old party. In light of this, Turati's frantic effort to persuade Bisolati to reject Jaliki's offer in March is all the more incomprehensible. Certainly, the Libyan War would have marked a split in the party and the end of official socialist cooperation with Jaliki, even if Bisolati had joined the government. The war made it impossible to heal the breach between right and left reformists and between the reformists and the rest of the party, I suppose. Although the long-term causes for the break are not easily to easy to understand without taking into account the influence of Kulishov's bleak pessimism on Turaki. Once the war began, the social, uh, socialist unity in Parliament unraveled. Jaliki's reaction to the split further indicated how his understanding of the socialist movement was restricted to the parliamentary group. On September 25, 1911, Jaliki telegraphed the king, Movimento socialisti non credo abbia importanza. Parecchi socialisti sono favorevoli all'impresa. Jaliki used the outbreak of the war to broaden the, left, the liberal majority. He had no qualms about cutting off the, the, the Socialist Party. The opposition socialists were rapidly marginalized as they had been between 1906 and 1909. Against the mass base of the party, Joliki resorted to the most severe police, uh, uh, police actions. He used the full powers of the law to ban meetings and to impose rigid censorship on the Socialist Party and press. In conclusion, I would argue that the Socialist Party as such was not essential to Joliki's plans. Much more important in 1903 and in subsequent years was the consolidation of the liberal majority, which might be extended to the right and to the left as circumstances dictated. And in, and he, in that sense, he would incorporate elements of socialism that he could break off. Instability within the Socialist Party and Joliki's constant pr itself and Jaliki's constant preoccupation with maintaining an alternative majority also limited the usefulness of the socialists. On the part of the socialists, Jaliki and tactics hastened the split within the party by separating right and left reformists and, the, and, and dividing the reformists from the rest of the movement. The, the disappointments of these years were never overcome, and a climate of faith as had existed at the turn of the century was never reestablished. Moreover, new leaders had never been part of, uh, who had never been part of Jaliki's system were pushing an agenda which would put the Socialist Party out of the framework of bourgeois part of politics for many, many years. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. The commenting on Alex Grant's paper will be John Alcorn. Uh, John is a colleague of mine in the History Department and is a visiting lecturer at Trinity College this year and uh, served in that capacity two years ago. In between, uh, that is last year, he uh, spent in Sicily doing research. Uh, he is completing his dissertation for Columbia University on the uh, Fasci Siciliani of 1893. John. I'd like to thank Spencer Di Scala and Borden Painter for including me in the conference. I think they formed a coalition on this. I'd also like to thank Spencer Di Scala for the encouraging remarks uh, towards junior scholars, as well as the guidance in helping select topics that need work. Lord knows in this moment, junior scholars could use a little encouragement. And I'd, uh, yeah. and I'd also like to compliment uh, uh, Professor Di Scala on pulling off the conference under adverse circumstances. Alexander de Grand has given us a rich taste of his work in progress on Giovanni Giolitti, work that comprises a reinterpretation of the, of the relations between Giolitti and the Socialists in the period 1903 to 1913. In my comment, I shall focus upon the matter of Giolitti's political faith, Fede Politica, as this was put to the test by the claims of the Socialist movement during his rule. 
The core of Professor DeGrand's argument on this matter may be summarized as follows. Jolici, wishing to stay in power, chose a political strategy of flexible centrism in coalition formation, a strategy consonant with his constitutionalist political culture. Corollary to Jolici's strategy was a tactic of shifting the coalition's boundaries to the left or to the right as political circumstances changed. The strategy placed constraints on the nature and pace of reforms and thus contributed to channeling the development of the Socialist Party out of the framework of bourgeois politics for many, many years, as Professor de Grand puts it. The argument is not without historical irony, for it amounts to a claim that Jolici was implementing Sidney Sonino's ideal of government by the center against his extremes, rather than the English model of alternation in power of progressive and conservative parties, which had been given forceful expression by Silvio Spaventa in the period of transformismo. The irony, of course, lies in the political rivalry between Giolitti and Sonnino in the period 1903 to 1913. And the argument is not without contemporary resonance, as Italians are grappling with the ill effects of a long period of centrist coalitional rule based upon clientelism, one such ill effect being an unsatisfied longing for political clarity, as Professor Grant describes the mood induced earlier by Giolitti's political strategy. Let us consider in turn two constraints Professor de Grand identifies in Jolici's political strategy. One is the subordination of policy to the desire to stay in power, the other a narrow political culture that prevented Jolici from understanding the socialists. Professor de Grand cites Roberto Vivarelli's judgment that Jolici was lacking in, quote, the very quality of his political faith, which was never profound enough to direct his intentions and within certain limits bind them. Unquote. Now, if we are to engage in the uh, ambiguous art of bestowing praise and blame upon historical actors, then my position, for what it is worth, is that this judgment of Jolici's political character is uncharitable. Since I have already noted the contemporary resonance of Professor de Grand's interpretation, perhaps you won't consider it too out of place to liken his characterization of Jolici's political faith to the doubts that have been cast on President Clinton's political integrity. I believe such judgments do not do justice to two facts of modern political life, namely that reforms require majority support in legislative assemblies, and that the political representatives who support the executive branch requires often approach political interaction as a form of bargaining. It's difficult for the executive power to reconcile the plural satisfaction of vested interests with the coherent pursuit of a more abstract, long-term conception of the public good. Uh, now, this tension is especially pronounced where there's a conflict between constitutionalism and democracy, as was the case in Italy prior to 1911, where political representation was based upon restricted suffrage. Or to put it another way, again with an eye to the present, we cannot rationally expect statesmen to succeed in the art of high politics if the motives at work in low politics are myopic and selfish. It is perhaps also the case, though this is merely conjecture, that constitutions such as Italy's then and now, which make the executive power responsible to parliament rather than to the electorate, promote flexibility, and to use Professor de Grand's term, in those who govern uh, at the expense of resoluteness. I'm therefore struck by Giolitti's ability to carry out bank reform without solid support in 1893 and to introduce universal male suffrage again without solid support towards the close of the period 1903 to 1913, two major reforms by any measure. To round out the discussion of the quality of Giolitti's political faith, consider the related issue of his political culture as revealed in his attitude towards the socialists. Professor de Grand argues that cooperation between Giolitti and the socialists rested upon, quote, a belief in the fragility of Italian political and social development, faith in gradualism, a preference for negotiation over direct action, agnosticism on free trade, and confidence in the expansion of the state sector. He goes on, unquote, he goes on to explain that this common ground was, quote, eventually outweighed by other more fundamental issues which Giolitti separated from the vast majority of socialists. Tax reform, the military budget, limits on unionization in the public sector, a growing belief in the corruption of the Giolittian majority, and finally the Libyan war, 
unquote. With sureness of touch, Professor DeGrand relates these disagreements to, quote, four fundamental distinctions that Joliki made when dealing with labor unrest. First, between economic and political, especially general strikes. Second, between private and public sector strikes. Third, between strikes in the North and those in the agrarian South. And fourth, between strikes led by reformists and those fought by revolutionaries. Now, this is a clear, accurate, comprehensive, and useful framework. Let me select from it uh, three elements for discussion. Strikes in the agrarian South, tax reform, and unionization in the public sector. Professor de Grand states that in the period 1903 to 1913, Joliki was especially harsh in putting down agricultural leagues in the southern strongholds of his supporters. In doing this, he rarely admitted their political or economic content, but rather relegated them to violations of criminal laws. Here, it might be instructive to compare Joliki's early and late policies toward the agrarian unrest in the South. In his first government, uh, in 1892 to three, um, it, 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 his government coincided with the foundation of the Socialist Party and with Italy's first great peasant strike, which took place on the Latifondi of Western Sicily. This strike was led by the Fasci Siciliani, organizations that were developing in symbiosis with the Socialist Party. When, in the summer of 1893, the police discovered that the Central Committee of Sicily's Socialists had decided to take a turn to the peasantry and to undertake a strike for better sharecropping contracts on the Latifondi, Joliki instructed uh, the prefects in Sicily to conduct a survey of the membership of the Fasci with special attention to persons with criminal records. By the way, it's a, it's a fantastic document that, according to the police commission of the socialists, uh, when they made the turn to the peasantry, repeatedly termed the peasants genia selvaggia, but uh, had more faith in their revolutionary temper. Um, while this survey of the League's membership was conducted, uh, the peasant strike assumed crisis proportions in the district of Corleone, but the prefect of Palermo reported to Joliti as follows, quote, Close scrutiny of each fascia reveals that those with criminal records compared to the rather large number of members are in a significant minority. Hence, I do not think we can dissolve the fascia on this basis. Um, but the prefect proceeded to press for repression anyway uh, uh, on directly pro political grounds. I quote, the fascia are but branches of the Central Committee of Palermo, led by the fearsome socialist Garibaldi Bosco, who tirelessly works to keep the Fasci ready to seize the first opportunity to rise up against the landowning class and the government, I therefore believe that all the Fasci should be forcibly dissolved. Now, Joliki did not accept the prefect's recommendation and made a firm point of pursuing a policy of constructive mediation combined with strict enforcement of the rule of law. For reasons that I can't consider here, a general settlement to the strike remained elusive despite government mediation. The bank scandal brought down Joliti, who was succeeded by Christie as the peasant movement spilled over into chaotic agitation against the regressive excise tax, the Dazio di Consumo. After some hesitation, Christie dissolved the Fasci in a state of siege on 3 January 1894. When the state of siege was put before Parliament post factum, Joliti voted to support a policy which he had resisted while in power. Namely, he voted for the state of siege. Keeping in mind uh, or, uh, Professor de Grand's remark that, quote, Joliti drew an important lesson from his first government in 1892 to 93, namely that it was difficult to maintain power in a stable way with a ministry drawn exclusively from one part of the Chamber of Deputies, unquote, we are left with the question. Did Joliti draw a second lesson from his first government, namely that a policy of constructive mediation could not work in agrarian conflicts in the South and had to be replaced with a policy of construing such conflicts as matters, of crimi matters for criminal law irrespective of the facts? I'd like to uh, introduce a, another brief consideration that you don't have in the paper I handed out. The argument that Joliki's policy towards peasant unrest in the South became hostage to the makeup of his parliamentary coalition is disturbing, and it would seem not to be controverted. In a word, Joliki appears to have subordinated a matter of rights to a calculus of political advantage. 
the result being an asymmetry in policies towards the North and the South on what the socialists instead deemed a matter of principle for Italy as a whole, the right to strike, the right to organize, and so on. Yet here we have a two-edged sword. For Turati's attitude towards the introduction of universal suffrage, another important issue, had the very same structure. Instead of approaching universal suffrage as a matter of a right, Turati approached it as a matter of political strategy. Uh, in, in 1903, Turati, and here I'll quote from Spencer Discala's book, opposed giving illiterates the vote, suggesting that seats in the Chamber of Deputies be distributed on the basis of the voting population of an area as a means of preventing Southern deputies from stopping reforms. That is, using dif regional differences in the, in the rate of illiteracy as a way of restricting the weight of the Southern political vote in order to favor the socialist program of reform. Um, it might be thought uh, that Turati, I don't want to be uncharitable, so it might be thought that Turati's position was based upon a, a principle to wit that the right to vote requires the capacity for political independence for which literacy, literacy is a necessary condition. But according again to Spencer Di Scala, Turati's policy uh, towards universal suffrage during the Jolitian period was largely guided by considerations of political advantage. As Turati feared that the enlargement of the Southern electorate would increase the political influence of the Catholic Church and weaken the Socialist Party. Turati's then, and Turati's indignation towards Jolitian's unprincipled regional distinctions in labor policy was a case of the pot calling the kettle black. Uh, of course, this was not true of socialist leaders as a whole. Think of Salvini. Uh, consider next the issue of tax reform. Professor de Grand writes with characteristic uh, straightforwardness, no politician spoke of tax reform as much and over as long a time as Giolitti, but did as little about it once in power. Unquote. Uh, he explains that Giolitti's, uh, quote, failure to, failure to live up to the promise of fiscal reform, unquote, was a, serious, was a reason for socialist disillusionment with Giolitti, especially in light of Anna Kulitsov's belief that tax reform was a conditio sine qua non of modernization and progress. Now, the regressive elements in fiscal policy that Giolitti failed to address in his partial reform were the set of excise taxes on items of basic necessity, and the incidence of local taxes altogether. It should be noted, though, that when in 1882 Giolitti um, first spoke out uh, for tax reform in what Josue Carducci famously termed the speech for salt and the bread of the poor, the discorso del pane, uh, del sale nel pane dei poveri, Giolitti uh, made it clear that he wished to center his efforts at tax reform on making direct taxes and national taxes on land and salt less regressive. Giolitti actually proposed to compensate for lost revenues because he was a fiscal conservative in, in, in other ways. He proposed to compensate for lost revenues by uh, redistributing taxes by increasing the incidence of excise taxes on consumption goods. I quote from the discourse. I believe that not only the duty of justice, but the promotion of sound finances requires us to ease the burden that weighs on taxpayers in the form of direct taxes and raise consumption taxes as needed, end quote. So we're left with the question, uh, did Joliti in fact fail to deliver on specific promises for specific kinds of tax reform, or did Joliti instead, and the socialists, espouse different programs for tax reform and the socialists misunderstand Joliti's program? The latter possibility is consonant with Professor de Graham's general view that leading socialists were prone to, quote, serious misreading of Giolitti's intentions, end quote. And uh, finally, what about the contrast between the socialists and Giolitti over unionization in the public sector? Professor de Graham summarizes Alberto Acquaroni's view, quote, Giolitti treated unionization in the private and public sectors differently because he wanted total control over the state apparatus which he used to regulate the process of change, end quote. This goes to the heart of the contrast between Giolitti and the socialists. Giolitti's aim, I'm tempted to say, Giolitti's political faith uh, was to modernize Italy. 
and modernity was understood in reference to the great powers of continental and Western Europe. Modernity comprised political democracy, economic development, military security, the gradual separation of civil society from political tutelage or nonage, sound finance, and cautious establishment of elements of both social insurance and social transfer payments as part of government. Now, to pursue modernization is not the same thing as to pursue a fully unionized economy. Indeed, there's reason to think the two incompatible in a range of social contexts. I'm going to go out on a limb here. <laughs> to speak with Professor de Grand's straightforwardness, Jolici was no fool in wishing to discourage unionization in the public sector. Unlike firms, bureaucracies tend to operate with soft budget constraints. To combine union bargaining power and a soft budget constraint with a political culture of patronage is not a program for efficient modernization of the economy or the polity, and Italy today stands witness. If this sounds unfair in, uh, to workers in the public sector in the period 1903 to 1913, consider another argument. Professor de Grand notes that Giolitti took harsh dis disciplinary measures against strikers on the railways. Now, weren't the uh, railway workers an aristocracy of labor? Other things being equal, workers in communications, transport, health, and necess necessary service sectors have more bargaining power than do other workers of comparable skill because their strategic location in the economy enables them credibly to threaten harm to the public if their demands are not met. In the Jolitian period, workers in the private sector, at least I believe that in the Jolitian period, workers in the private sector stood much more in need of unionization in order to achieve fair wages and working conditions than did workers in the public sector. So there's something to be said for the fact that Giolitti preferred to restrict the bargaining power of strategically placed workers <laughs> while extending government assistance in the form of pensions to those without bargaining power, the old and the infirm. Maybe today in the U.S. the old have bargaining power, but they didn't in Italy in 1903. In the end, uh, much of my politics is the art of making hard choices about the principles, mechanisms, and criteria for allocating scarce resources with some notion of justice in mind, including utilitarianism and the maximization of so social welfare as a notion of justice. Uh, Jolitti practiced this art within the horizons of his political culture, which, as Professor de Grand shows, was different from and partly at odds with the socialist political culture. But I'm inclined to think that Giolitti's attitude towards the socialists was colored less by lack of understanding than by a clear-headed commitment to his own political faith. In sum, Professor de Grand makes a powerful case for interpreting Giolitti's strategy of coalition formation as flexible centrism, tacking between the socialist left and the Catholic right. He also argues convincingly that Giolitti's strategy caused, helped to cause a split in the socialist movement ultimately pushing the Socialist Party outside the framework of bourgeois politics for a period. And he offers a clear, accurate, comprehensive, and useful classification of Giolitti's policies and, relatedly, the Socialist's programmatic demands. On the other hand, his judgment of the adequacy and integrity of Giolitti's policies is less persuasive. Giolitti's policy on agrarian strikes in the South appears to have been unprincipled, but perhaps not so much more so than some of the socialist policy on suffrage. Um, and uh, in any case, Giolitti's policies on tax reform and unionization in the public sector were more robust. Despite a measure of disagreement, I find Professor de Grand's interpretation stimulating, insightful, thorough, resonant in the present, and forthright. I look forward to his larger work on Giolitti. Thank you, John. We have a few minutes for some questions and comments from any of the members of the panel. Yes, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Well, I, I am student because I've done this all my life, but I'll do it once again. <laughs> now, I've been very pleased that the last, uh, that the grand paper and the comment did come across some of the gender. Um, I was a little bit puzzled by the fact that in 
Landolsky, any census comment in a sense. You did not even mention Anna Kulisha. And yet, there is a whole historiographical, I guess, to some extent, probably would require much more than what it is, but um, uh, there is a, some kind of historiographical tradition as to the role she played in uh, the evolution of Turati toward the reformist position. Now, Spencer seems to claim that this never took place, but you didn't specifically mention this. Now, I would like you to speculate on that. Also, I, there are a couple of other instances, among others, that come in particular in the last two papers. Uh, Alexander has, Alex has, has, has mentioned a number of times, Anna Kulishov, his position, etc. cetera. Uh, but there are a couple of things, for instance, where, again, this gender perspective would perhaps lead us to look at it, finally, at the history of the socialist movement with the, in the depth that it deserves, okay? Now, for instance, we always talk about the agrarian south, but the, is that the agrarian north is the reason why the agrarian north, the weight of the struggle in the agrarian north are never taken into consideration in, in a sense, reconstructing uh, the negotiating power, the attitude, etc. It's perhaps because, as usual, the agrarian north was mostly the larger components were, of course, female workers, and therefore there is a usual loss of visibility on one hand. And finally, one last thing that uh, John in Alcor in his comment, when you talk about the uh, private sector, public sector, um, the need for workers in the public uh, sector at much less need, in a sense, <laughs> of striking for life. Well, in the public sector, there was one sector, education, that you didn't mention. Again, that meant teachers. Again, socialist women, uh, socialist teachers were very largely unionized. Uh, they were a majority of teachers. What was the weight? They didn't have any weight. Okay. okay, but I would like this coordinate to meet sometime and have a history that would give visibility to this component in many ways. Thank you. Spencer, do you want to ask your own question? Before I go any further, I would like to wish Margarita a happy birthday. Okay. <laughs> I guess I'm in deep enough trouble as it is, so I don't want to get into any more. Um, my comments were short. I, I met no slight on a course of who um, I know a lot about and so on. And uh, I really didn't mention anyone else besides Turati. And of course, Khrushchev is uh, completely part of that. Um, so this was just, um, I guess my comments were oriented more towards uh, the revolutionary syndicalists. And, and uh, I slighted a lot of other people in my comments as well, male as well as, as uh, female. So I don't want you to take this as, uh, you know, any kind of denigration of Khrushchev's contributions. Now, it's interesting that um, you asked also whether, um, or you, you took up on my point that Turaki had never gone through this revolutionary change, uh, supposed revolutionary, to, um, to uh, reform it. Uh, I still maintain that. I think that is very true. And I think that one of the reasons, perhaps the major reason for this, is this is, of course, Anna Kulishov, who had gone through that change much earlier. And I think by the time uh, they were together, uh, she had, of course, gone through a lot, she had gone through the change of, of ideology, as, as you well know. And there was no reason uh, for Turati to do the same thing. I think that, in fact, his. Um, um, his Marxism or his ideology was very much influenced by Anna Kurosawa. But I also want to add something else, and that is, um, in the historiography, if anything, um, as far as the ideology has been concerned, and I think this is all part of the same pattern I mentioned before, in a sense, uh, Turati, I don't think, has or has been viewed as a, in a different way, that is, as being too much influenced by Anna Kurosawa. That if you go through the letters um, of the two, you see time and time again where there are struggles, there are disagreements between the two. It was really a dialogue, and this is 
on Kulisov's uh, statement, I mean, you could go through the letters, which he spaces, some beautiful letters in which he, he makes this point. I mean, we, we don't have to think, uh, you know, a simplistic way, one person influences another, and that's it. And I think that's the way, that has been, that's been the, re- the way the relationship has been seen. I mentioned this in, in another way also, and that is the view towards the uh, that is, the, the, the pro-Jalisian person has always been seen as Prati, and of course, you know, when Jalisi was uh, criticized and so on and so forth, then Prati made, you know, the big mistake because he, he followed Jalisi um, um, uh, and so on and so forth. But if you go through these letters, you will see some very, very nice statements about Jalisi by Anna Kulishov. Now, it's true that later she changed her mind as she criticized Jalisi and so on and so forth, but the same thing happens with Tarasi. And the point is, uh, you know, we, we tend to, you know, for brevity, tend to sum up these things and say, well, you know, well, this person said that and quote something. But of course, these things are limited in time. Uh, somebody may have been seen in a certain way in 1903, but differently in 1911. That's all only normal. And I guess uh, that historians like to make a splash, in a sense, by, you know, making these categorical statements. It, in effect, they're misleading. So that's what I want to say on that point. But I'll leave uh, the other points to yeah. John. And, uh, uh, John, would you like to briefly? Yeah. Well, well, I, uh, I, I welcome um, Margarita's remark. I, I, it, it stands as an important qualification to the rather simple dichotomy that I propose that is inadequate. So I, I welcome your remark as, as standing for the record. Uh, well, I was just going to make a... a, a in a sense, any reading of the Torah to Kulishov Cartejo is, is a selective one. I mean, you can find a million judgments, and they waver constantly on, on Jaliti. I took a very pessimistic reading of it. Um, but uh, and I, I came away, although I'm really not very, really, uh, I don't know that much about the Socialist Party, and maybe I... There are other people who could have done this a lot better than I could, but I, I came away with the impression that uh, that she had the stronger positions a lot of times, and uh, especially in that 1911, 19, 1910, 1911 period, saw better what was going to emerge from the whole process than did Turati. Uh, I, 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 that's just my impression, however. Chiedo scusa, ma nella, nel concludere la mia relazione avevo saltato proprio un punto che riguardava eh, una dirigente socialista che forse ha altrettanta importanza nella storia del PSI, eh, della stessa Anna Culisco, che è di Argentina Alfobelli che era stata la segretaria e la leader della Federazione Italiana dei Lavoratori della Terra dalla sua Costituzione nel 1904 fino al fascismo, se non eh, La citavo, eh, lo ricordo perché eh, proprio in Argentina Altobelli appare eh, questa compresenza tra una cultura riformista e una cultura massimalista rivoluzionaria. Eh, nel senso che Argentina Altobelli, che si proclamava ed era piano politico una riformista, in quanto dirigente dell'organizzazione dei lavoratori della terra, seguiva con interpretazioni ancora più estremistiche, a mio parere, la linea strategica eh, tracciata da Kautsky nella questione agraria. Lei aveva tra l'altro conosciuto Kautsky in Germania, è stato anche ospite a casa, a casa di Kautsky lungamente e ha studiato con lui appunto la questione della terra. E la Ottobelli eh, ha sempre eh, percorso una, una linea, una, una strada eh, che certamente era riformista perché portava alla, al rafforzamento dell'organizzazione cooperativa e alla, all'insediamento di istituzioni sociali nel mondo contadino dell'epoca, ma nello stesso tempo, eh, avevo citato appunto il congresso di Bologna, impostazioni politica, di politica agraria del congresso di Bologna, eh, vedeva eh, il movimento cooperativo finalizzato a un processo di collettivizzazione della, della terra stessa e questo la portava, tra l'altro, 
a quello che poi è apparso un gravissimo errore che emergerà nella crisi della democrazia alla fine del primo conflitto mondiale, è portata a una separazione, anzi a un conflitto tra il movimento dei braccianti, dei lavoratori della terra, dei salariati, con i piccoli proprietari, in gran parte organizzati poi dal da movimento cattolico, o con gli affittuari, i mezzadri, i coloni, eccetera, in gran parte poi invece organizzati dal Partito Repubblicano, specie nell'Emilia e nell'Emilia Romagna, ha una conflittualità che diventava, diventava molte volte persino uno scontro, uno scontro fisico, notevolmente cruento. Quindi proprio in Argentina Alcobelli, che è un personaggio straordinario a mio giudizio, una donna eh, di grandissime capacità politiche, sindacali e organizzative, la federazione della terra ha raggiunto a un certo punto addirittura gli 850.000 iscritti, che era, una, era un, un numero enorme per l'epoca di, di aderenti, eh, seguiva appunto questa, eh, questa linea contraddittoria, che era riformista sul piano politico, parzialmente riformista anche per quello che riguardava le istituzioni sociali, l'organizzazione cooperativa, eh, ma eh, nel, 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 nei mezzi di lotta e nelle finalità ultime eh, dell'azione nel mondo contadino è in realtà è un massimalista e apertamente massimalista eh, rivoluzionaria. E quindi eh, mi chiedo scusa di non averla prima citata nella mia relazione, appunto per ragioni, per ragioni di brevità, ma certamente era giusto il richiamo che ha fatto la signora Margherita eh, al fatto che noi abbiamo sempre poi questa punta di maschilismo e ci porta a, prefer- a, preferire, a preferire le vicende dei personaggi del nostro sesso. Grazie. Ho chiesto di parlare in italiano perché vorrei fare telegrafiche osservazioni sulla bella relazione di Landolfi che avendo egli parlato in italiano si fa giusto continuare. Landolfi ha giustamente messo in luce che vi fu uno scivolamento verso posizioni di sinistra rivoluzionaria nel socialismo italiano, particolarmente al sud. E perché più al sud che al nord. Una risposta può essere le condizioni di vita certamente peggiori dei lavoratori del sud rispetto a quelle del nord.